Hello everyone. Today we are going to be discussing about poliomyelitis. Uh, and uh, as we have already know that this poliomyelitis is an important uh, cause of a kind of uh, muscular paralysis actually. So it is very very important in neurology. So now let us dive into the topic. Actually, by definition, poliomyelitis as it is abbreviated as polio. Poliomyelitis can be defined as an infection. I will just say polio is defined as defined as in a uh, viral infection viral infection that is caused by actually uh, caused by polio virus a kind of virus called polio virus so the name of the virus is not that difficult just polio virus actually so this is a virus that is causing this uh, polio myelitis and the symptoms of this polio myelitis ranges from asymptomatic cases to a kind of paralysis actually so this is it this polymyelitis is defined as the viral infection which is caused by polio virus actually and the, uh, the symptoms ranges from either asymptomatic or minor illness to a kind of complete paralysis of a kind of, uh, of a particular muscle, muscle group actually so let us dive into the topic so now let us see since we said this polymyelitis is a kind of infection so, uh, specifically virus, that is this polio, uh, polio virus. So, how does this virus is transmitted from one person to another? Since it is, or how it is transmitted? The, uh, the virus can be transmitted from one person to another, actually. And it, the important mode of transmission of this virus is fecal oral. So, when we are talking about the transmission, the important mode of transmission of this virus is a kind of fecal oral transmission. Fecal oral transmission. Because... Why? What do uh, I mean by this focal, uh, fecal oral transmission is, for example, if a person is actually contracted with the virus, so this virus is going to be shed into his stool. So fecal oral transmission. So in the stool of, in the stool of feces, in the stool of already infected person, already infected person. Then, if for example that stool by any means contaminate the water or food by this uh, stool then the stool it is uh, carrying the virus or simply let's say let us put it put it this way actually when a person ingests a food which is contaminated by this virus uh, so food it may be even water not only food so food water contaminated with this polio virus actually so this person ingests it then this virus can actually uh, infect him actually so that is it that's in that, that's what we call the fecal oral transmission so that is it and uh, let us see the pathophysiology of this virus Pato. physiology of the virus so for the uh, pathophysiology of the virus actually this virus when you ingest it actually through uh, the, the, the oral cavity it actually going to enter as a cells that actually came in contact with it first specifically the virus actually enters the cells enters the cells of the pharynx of the pharynx and the intestine and the intestine so when this virus enters into the cells of the pharynx, so how do this virus enter into the cells of the pharynx and then the intestinal cells? This virus do this by actually adhering or attaching to the cells by a kind of molecule called CD155. This is a kind of immunoglobulin-like molecule that is possessed by the virus, possessed by the polio virus. So this CD155 is possessed by this virus and uh, it uses this CD155 to attach itself in the uh, cells, actually, the intestinal cells or the pharyngeal cells, actually. So, by attaching to itself to this cells, actually, it will going to be endocytosed. That is, it is going to enter into the cell. So, attach, then it will going to be endocytosed. That is, endocytosis mediated transport, right? Endocytosed into the cell. So, as the virus enters into the cell, actually, it will going to use the cell's machinery, 
that is the enzyme of the cell the protein of the cell to replicate itself and we have we have to really know that this virus is an rna virus actually it's an rna virus so it uses the enzymes and the machineries for replication of that particular cell it enters to replicate itself that is to duplicate itself into many copies actually so to make itself into what many copies to reproduce itself into large number of uh, kind of another uh, other polio virus actually so use the cells machinery that cells equipment for replication cells equipment or machinery for replication to replicate itself into many copies actually into many copies so as the virus replicate itself actually this virus then will going to come outside from the cells actually and then it will going to infect uh limp lymphatic tissues as we have already read we have a lot of examples of lymphatic tissues so this virus will going to enter this lymphatic tissues it will enter in the intestine we have pears patches right these pears patches they are kind of lymphatic tissues right so they are going to actually enter into the pears patches they are going to actually enter into reticular endothelial cells reticular endothelial system they are going to enter into actually a kind of tonsils also that is when we are talking about the pharynx pharyngeal cells when they come outside from the pharyngeal cells tonsils lymph node and whatsoever so this virus as it ent uh, enters into this uh, this uh, already replicated virus that is a lot of virus after uh, they have been reproduced inside the intestinal cells and the pharyngeal cells so when they come out they are going to infect these pears patches reticular endothelial cell system uh, tonsils actually then from there they are going to have susceptibility to enter into the bloodstream now they are going to have access to the to the bloodstream then from there they will enter into bloodstream enter into blood stream actually so this condition is known as viremia so this is the pathophysiology so how this virus is actually uh, doing its own job inside the the, the, the the body that's bad job right so that is it so now let us see the forms of this uh, virus after it enters into the uh, uh the, the blood actually the consequences will occur so oh, the the outcomes so let us see the outcomes outcomes so the outcomes they are divided into actually almost four categories right so number one the virus may the patient will may, may be asymptomatic which is in most cases asymptomatic asymptomatic in most cases because especially if the person is immunocompetent actually if the person is immunocompetent in immunocompetent individual that is has good immunity right so the virus is asymptomatic the infection is asymptomatic the patient will not even uh, notice any changes in his body right so that is it and then another outcome it may be if the patient is not lucky to be asymptomatic the patient can be can have a kind of minor illness minor illness which is not specific to uh polio virus infection this minor illness can ranges from for example let's say sore throat because it uh, remember they infect the parental cells sore throat or abdominal pain abdominal pain uh, a kind of vomiting or rarely diarrhea actually so that is it then if the patient is not also lucky to have this the patient may also uh, may have a kind of uh, non-paralytic aseptic meningitis non-paralytic aseptic because if meningitis is caused by virus we term it as aseptic right if it's bacteria then it is aseptic right so that's it aseptic meningitis meningitis so that is it if the patient is, is lucky enough he will just be asymptomatic he will not even notice any changes if the patient uh, is not lucky to have asymptomatic then uh, to, to remain asymptomatic then he may have this minor illness as we have already mentioned if he's not lucky enough to stay in this minor illness he may fall under this category non-paralytic and if he is not lucky enough the bad luck is we don't like the first category because even this non-paralytic aseptic meningitis is self-relieved actually 
it is self relieved so the patient may uh, develop a kind of paralytic polio which is specific to polio right paralytic uh, polio myelitis right and this paralytic polio myelitis is actually categorized also into three the patient may either have spinal paralytic polio or the patient may have a kind of bulba bulba paralytic polio or he may have bulbospinal bulbospinal paralytic polio so we have to really notice that the asymptomatic cases are the most common in almost 74 percent while minor illness in minor illness uh, in and in the case of minor illness only maybe two to four percent actually and 24 percent actually while non-paralytic maybe two to four percent and then the remaining percent this paralytic polio and also if the patient happens to have this form that is this paralytic polio he may have either spinal paralytic polio bulbar paralytic polio or bulbospinal and but in most cases it's spinal paralytic then followed by this bulbar and in rare cases we may have this case of uh, bulbospinal paralytic polio so that is it so now let us see the the, the, the symptoms actually of each asymptomatic we know there is, there is no symptoms minor illness we, we see the symptoms then non-paralytic aseptic meningitis the patient will have a kind of symptoms of uh, meningitis right then he may have headache fever um, let's say kind of vomiting stiff neck for example since it is meningitis right irritation of the meninges so that is it so now most uh, concerning this presentation we are going to be talking about this paralytic polio actually because they are the most dangerous because even this is, is self remittent is re uh, self uh, relieved actually so even without medication it can go away but this actually the patient has to have a kind of support actually so that is it so now let us dive into these three categories so that is it so number one if we are going to talk about uh, spinal paralytic spinal paralytic polio in spinal paralytic polio actually from the word spinal it's affecting the spinal cord mainly if you say this is spinal cord section for example we have this dorsal horn we have a kind of anterior horn so this central canal here so this virus is going to attack the cells that are here that is cells of the anterior horn that is the ventral horn it didn't uh, have any job with this posterior horn but this anterior horns actually so when it attack this anterior horns then definitely as we have already know that this anterior horn it is the one that uh, actually through it the motor system right motor pathway here sensory pathway right so it will enter into the cells that are here causing inflammation here so from inflammation it will progress to a kind of degeneration of the cells degeneration this degeneration has it is a kind of term called valerian degeneration so this polio causes this valerian degeneration valerian degeneration actually so that is it so depending on which kind of muscles group are going to be affected depend on which region it may affect the cervical region of the spinal cord it may affect thoracic region it may affect lumbar region so that is it so for example let's say if the spinal cord affects for example let's say uh, cervical to thoracic region definitely the person will going to have a kind of symptoms that are associated with upper limb paralysis right because it is from there we have the brachial plexus whatsoever plexus so that is it if it affect the lumbar region we have lumbar plexus right so in, in lumbar plexus in the part the patient will going to have a kind of paralysis in the lower limbs right so that is it so with the symptoms of this spinal uh spinal uh po paralytic polio is you're going to have a kind of unilateral mostly is unilateral but bilateral also can occur but mostly is unilateral unilateral placid paralysis placid paralysis but with intact with intact sensory innervation of the area 
because it is affecting the only the the the, the, the anterior or not the posterior right so that is it and also the patient will going to have a kind of absent absent uh, a kind of deep reflexes deep tendon reflexes reflexes and also if the patient is actually having denivation of his muscles the muscles cannot function right so if the muscles cannot be moved then definitely the muscles can undergo a kind of atrophy of disuse right because they are not they are not innervated that is denivation atrophy or disuse atrophy of the muscles and let's say for example the muscles that are involved let's say we have trunk muscle specifically intercostal muscles if the patient has involvement of intercostal muscles then definitely it will affect his breathing right so effect on breathing if intercostal muscle are involved effect on breathing actually so actually these are the uh, some symptoms of uh, spinal uh, polio actually so that is it so in the next video we are going to see the symptoms of the bulba polio and then the uh, the the bulbospinal polio actually because that one they are the most dangerous actually so that is it so see you in the next video thank you <laughs>